Good morning, nerds, and welcome back to Chicago. We're here at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con. My name's Savannah Peterson, joined with John Furrier and some wonderful industry analysts this morning. We are going to be serving you AI for breakfast. I hope you're ready. John, are you ready? I'm drunk on AI already. I've been drinking <laughs> it all day. You, know? you got after yeah. you had AI mimosas this morning? We've been drinking the AI love all week here. <laughs> loving, loving the AI. Yes, we have, and it has been such a theme of the show. You're all familiar now with Dustin, our newest analyst, but a industry veteran and we also have Andy who has AI in his last name. So this is you've been you were born for this. <laughs> Quite literally I mean, perhaps. I don't know about that, but okay, I'll take that as a compliment. <laughs> You're AI native. <laughs> AI native. That's a good one. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great to see I you. I get that. Woo, it's gonna be a punny day here on theCUBE, folks. Get ready and buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> All right. So so since we're talking to you, Andy, what 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 has been the theme of AI at the show? I mean obviously it's the buzz, there's hype, but distill that for us. What are you seeing as the theme? So when it comes to, you know, uh, first of all, uh, cloud native is trying to jump on the bandwagon of AI, which I think they're a little, loo a little late to the game. The China's mm -hmm. already left the station because particularly CNCF is known for providing open source and bringing this massive developer base into helping things out with the cloud, which they did a really good job. If you look at all the projects that graduated, Kubernetes is right on oh, the top. Absolutely and Prometheus, hats off. Everybody yeah. uses it, right? Yeah, yeah. So that portion of it, they nailed it. With AI, they are still trying to figure out that what do we want to do with it, what do we help? And in the meanwhile, there are other open source projects, whether it's you know uh, Google is contributing to it, or even LinkedIn doing some Spotify, uh, Amazon doing it, everybody is throwing their head in it. And then even Databricks has the massive offerings that they have that Great in point. there for MLOps and other stuff. Yeah. And, and things like Langchain and, and Llama Index and even open source LLM, everybody is throwing open source stuff around. So CNCF is somewhat left behind this massive base and they are like, they woke up and they're all of a sudden like, oh, we got to do stuff. We're <laughs> going to infuse the AI. I'm like, I still don't see any really meaty, worthy announcements here, but at least they are talking about it now. But we'll see. Yeah, it's more the hallway track yeah, than, it is. Than, than a cornerstone. Yeah, Dustin, would you agree? What Mostly, I think. Um. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a no. That's I don't a no, agree no, with that, but I'll, I'll counter that. I'll, Go ahead. I'll just take it yeah. to a slightly different direction. <laughs> uh, I think Andy's right to a large extent, you know, and, and we said it on the first day, Tim Hawkins said it on the first day, Kubernetes yeah. was not built for AI. Yeah. Not initially, yeah. anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and that's just, that's a fact. Now, yeah. can Kubernetes pivot into that direction, or maybe just simply not pivot, but expand into that direction? Yes, absolutely. Kubernetes is a great abstraction of massive amounts of hardware network, compute, and, um, and, and storage, absolutely. all of which the biggest AI ML workloads need. Yeah, well, I mean, I would disagree with Andy on this point. Well, it's nuanced. I would disagree in the sense of CNCF is really not in the AI game, they're yeah. in more of the foundation game. But, yep. but the companies here, their infrastructure, so they're late to the party mainly because they're, they can't rely on the current AI that yep. people are getting buzzed about because it's infrastructure. You can't run LLMs on, it's not easy. Generative AI is not yet baked. But you know, you look at Ansible and all these automation fat features. They've been doing automation for years. So I see this more skeptical practitioners are more AI aware, less AI in production, mainly because they don't see a path, in my opinion. So like looking at the, now every company here has an AI story. Some are AI washing, some are <laughs> saying I'm leaning into AI. So I just think that it's more on the app side where you're seeing the AI wrappers. Right versus like, hey, I'm going to roll out Kubernetes AI, because there's no real fit there, in my opinion. I mean, that, that, I mean that's my take. What so, are you, what are you, what are you you're, going, you're nodding, what are you saying? I, I, think, I think that's right. I think, uh, I think there's quite He's a bit of- it this morning, yeah. doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's yeah. Being nice. You don't have to be nice we're to being, us, Dustin. Tell us polite. what you really think. That's the whole point here. of this segment. No, it's very nuanced. No, he's right. Yeah. Uh, Andy's right, because there's no AI like direct Bullseye here. It's all kind of in the in the yeah, glue fringes, layers. There's a yeah. lot of um, pre-existing data. So log files you're seeing, for example, in observability. Yep. Tons of AI yep. thinking. Right. There's still but not way too much. So there's still way too much complexity in Kubernetes to be generally useful for any given uh, AI developer. Okay. And there was a lot That's, in yeah. the keynote this morning about reducing that complexity, abstracting away all of the 
uh, underlying infrastructure that you still need to understand. You're talking about Kubernetes Tim Hawkins keynote. Yeah, Tim's okay, what keynote. Did he, what was he, what was he saying? You know, I think the major, uh, the, the, the keynote was entitled into the second decade of Kubernetes. Amazing to think it's been 10 years, uh, but now we're looking. Wow, that actually just made me feel old. Like that, right? <laughs> yeah. Like that, right? Looking into the next decade, what's going to drive the next trillion core hours of Kubernetes was the, the question. Uh, AIML is the obvious yeah. immediate uh, answer. Maybe there's others that come after that. Uh, so driving that, what, what needs to happen? And one of the big things uh, that was brought up, and I think is a very astute point, is uh, that we need to reduce the complexity. That Kubernetes is still way too complex for any yeah. given app developer to just write their app and expect it to scale globally. It can, but you've got to know way too much about cluster management, networking, storage, uh, baked into your application as opposed to simply expecting that from your underlying platform. So, I agree with that. So, the next trillion core hours is going to come from AI ML, whether I like it or not. But again, to going back to your original point, containers were not originally bid for AI workloads. And even now, it's not majority AI workloads you know, that's going into you know, the, the cubes and, and containers. So, what they're trying to do is, rather than, like you said, the, the complexity of managing the clusters and the environment and have a multi clusters is extremely complicated. Mm. AI cannot wait for that. You cannot go and micromanage these things to build training models because the training models are massive. Last I want to worry about, that's such a small thing. So what they're doing is that they're moving up as we are talking about. We are talking about distributed computing like Ray and Dask and Apache Spark and other things. Right. So all those you know, smaller micromanaging things of cluster, none of that is needed now. We're going to move a level up right. in order to train massive things. And, and they were talking about the fact that the LLMs, the OpenAI one particularly, was trained on 7,500 containers. I mean, if you're a micromanager of containers, you'll lose your mind, <laughs> you know, so. Well, the hallucination risk is huge. I mean, in fact, that's what, um, I just saw Amar Awadala, former Cloudera founder, was on uh, New York Times about his Victera was doing a LLM hallucination kind of test, kind of kind of give you a level of how high you are or how hallucinogen you are. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because if you look at, look at uh, infrastructure, and, and Google Next, Dustin, we had this conversation because on the consumer side, it's all cool. Mm. On the infrastructure side, it's about what data do you have, sure. right? So, so you back up and saying, what data is out there in this world? Is there a lot of, is Kubernetes going off a lot of data? Is, what it, where's the AI opportunity now in this world if it's IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, Crunching that data is Kubernetes' real opportunity. Storage is an attachment to Kubernetes. Uh, Kubernetes, in, in some cases, depends on, relies on, provides access to lots of data. In some cases, fast uh, access to data. In others, you know, it can be tempered a bit. Uh, but Kubernetes is all about crunching, crunching those, crunching yeah. those numbers. Um, interestingly, I wanted to ask Andy a question on this. On this. Uh, Please do. Yeah, so, so we were just right talking. Here. Yeah, <laughs> we were talking just before we went live about our shared experiences at IBM, you know, two decades ago. Uh, IBM Watson being one of the, maybe uh, call it the prototype uh, for AI. What do you the see MVP as some of, for sure. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, OG, so what do you see as some of the you know, big differences and changes to go from where we had you know, Watson a decade ago to where we are today with OpenAI to where do we need to go to next for that, you know, that, that real next step function change? Right, so what IBM was building in those days was more of a, cognitive knowledge systems. They were trying to solve a specific problem. Not a general AI, right. but it's more of a specific problem. And it was way ahead of its time. It, given the storage technology model training limitations, what they achieved with the, the Deep Blue to beat the best chess player in the world, and, and, and beat the Jeopardy champion in the specialized world. Right, specialized workloads. That's the point. Right. It's a very specialized, it does only one job, it does phenomenally right. well. That, they mastered. And then apply to healthcare, I know that was one of, one of the... Yeah, which didn't particularly go well, but again, <laughs> now what's happening is, is almost all this other, the LLMs and everything else that's coming out, including open AIs, it is almost reaching the, the level of general AI knowledge and intelligence, even though it's not there with the cognitive abilities, but it's about, you know, I know the entire, the world database, all the data that you need to know. Sure. I will try to figure out what you want to know. It is at that level, it's not still kind of a cognitive system yet, but eventually when they are able to marry these two, 
I mean, the, some of the releases, we, we were talking about the OpenAI GPT-4 Turbo. Yeah. Oh my God. I yeah. mean, the innovation that they did in the last six months. I mean, the initial couple of releases. Their DevJ was inspiring. I got to say, watching that whole keynote was very Apple-esque. It yeah. felt like an Apple iPhone moment where it's like people were cheering. Yeah. This is pretty cool. I mean, yeah. like, what was the last time you saw a <laughs> keynote that good? Yeah. I mean, Apple doesn't even have good keynotes anymore. They, they do videos. Right. They do like a customer video. There's no it, more innovation. It has reached that moment. Yeah, and, and not only that, uh, going back to the point, by the way, OpenAI started, it all started here in the CNCF. That's a, the first one he was giving a keynote here, wasn't it? About yeah, five, yeah. six years ago. And they just let that go. And then they are still falling yeah. behind here, but whereas you know, and I went on to become the AI moment of the world, right? Um, if you look at that conference, the Dev Day alone, the attendees, we are talking about you know tens of thousands. You know, people are engaging in that, leaving these other open source programs behind. So they're going to contribute to that ecosystem to build things out of that. And OpenAI is going to figure out a way to monitor I mean, that. My, 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 I, I think you're right on on this one because I think the AI conversation is not so much who has the AI. It's standard now. The experience and the consumerization of AI that ChatGPT has done, and now the technologies available is going to make every company and every vertical have to integrate it in because there's a clear advantage of having it, whether it's some sort of augmentation to humans, scaling data. Productivity. I, I, I just mean. don't see a company not having it. It's like the web saying, I'm not going to have a website because, see, that, oh, I, I, it's not productive for people to serve, get information on their That's own. going to be the next way, right? I mean, right now, most of these companies are trying to figure out, you know, I want to compete against OpenAI's LLM or I want to produce an LLM. Unless you have deep pockets, and unless you have a stockpile of GPUs, you can't compete against that. I mean, there are already three or four established players in that OpenAI, Anthropic, Cohere, and Google, and whatnot. And even the big guys like AWS stayed behind. They're like, we don't want to get involved in that, right? So that's not a winning game for you if you want to do that. So the, the obvious way would be either go on the data side of things, whether it's Snowflake or Databricks or any of these guys, you know what, I'll, I'll figure out a way to give you the data lake and whatnot, what you want to do, easier way to do that. Or you can get into that model by doing ML ops, by providing the productionization of the AI models. So that's another way to do it. There are, there are tons of opportunities, not just getting an open LLM or LLM yeah. out there and competing against ChatGPT. There are smaller components that you can excel in. There are companies working on that big time. Well, I think, I think you bring up a really good point, and it's, it's kind of late to the hype curve party, but still very early in terms of right. how this is all going to manifest in exactly. its, its application. Yep. So I'm curious, uh, Andy, building on that, what does the CNCF community need to do to catch back up? Do you think that it's possible? Do you think the AI train is running away from us and there's nothing we can do? You know, what, what do you think about it? Well, it is running, but there are things that they're doing which I think uh, they did uh, a little bit more, for example, we talked about the MLOps thingy, and uh, one of the major uh, components of MLOps or source, uh, uh, the offering rather, is, uh, is called Kubeflow, as you know, which is part mm -hmm. of the CNCF community. Originally it was actually uh, developed by Google, and then that was about seven years ago. And they took about seven years to bring that in just about late last year, right? And they waited long enough. And there are other components like that just sitting out there, and. Uh, they should make a move to go there. We were just talking about it on the other day in the AI Hub. And I'm like, I'd love to get involved if you want me to be, you know. <laughs> and they they got to go and get engage those things because you have the massive developer community who can write anything, right? Yeah. And you have problems to solve. Why are you keeping away from it? Just engage, bring them in, yeah, bring they them on the data board, already. put it as a project. They got the data sitting there. Well, the key is, what do you guys think of the most disruptive areas? I mean, ML, ML Ops has been around for a while. Some of it may be new and old. What are the areas you see in this community, uh, this show, where there's an instant disruption in a good way? Is it observability? Is it telemetry? Is it um, exhaust? What exhaust, what data is valuable, I guess is the question. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. And then what's not valuable, what's old? Like what do we not use from AI ops from, you go back three or four years ago, AI ops was a whole different conversation. It had nothing to do with generative, anything. Yeah, I, I, I feel strongly about this. Uh, not all data, this is going to be controversial, but I don't think all data is valuable. I think some data needs to be processed and then discarded. Uh, uh, the amount of money and time and energy that goes into data storage, uh, I mean, 
go check your Snowflake bill, you know, go check your Amazon S3 <laughs> bill. Uh, there's a lot of data out there that is stored because we've been trained to, oh, data, data's cheap, storage is free, just store yeah. everything. We might have a use for it sometime in the future. I don't know about that, especially at the edge, yeah. when we're talking about, you know, lots of devices. Really agree with you there. So useful yeah. to use that data to, to retrain models, but at some point, I don't know, discard it. Delete your data. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Should you be a data hoarder, or, and just for the sake of hoarding <laughs> uh, I, or, data, or, or should you Marie Kondo that stuff? I, I, I'm, storage I'm in, wars. I'm in Marie and Kondo. it's even good or clean or useful. You yeah. know, it's not storing it to store it. Yeah. yeah. And, and, does, and it, the, does it spark joy? <laughs> <laughs> and the funny part is the whole data hoarding. What you're talking about? It's storage wars. Mostly structured data, which means it's comparatively cheaper to store. Uh. Even that itself was people are feeling a pinch. The next wave is the unstructured data that's coming in, images, yep. and video, and audio. Yep. If you start holding that, oh yeah. man, you're going to be nailed with that. Yeah. But talking about you know, what is useful, yeah. the observability being part of, so when it comes to AI application, yeah. there are two parts to it. One is applying you know, how to use the AI systems in there like LLMs. The other part is more like you know, bringing in AI to do some of the observability and monitoring and other things. So yeah. things like, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, I totally Absolutely. agree. But just Dustin, I kind of, I'm the opposite of you. I like to store everything. Everything. I'm a hoarder. I yeah. like to store everything. It was like <laughs> just, just in case. Um, that's a good thing or bad thing. I mean, it could come back and bite. No, the point is, this is a tough conversation because yeah. some it people, is. what do you store? I mean, for cybersecurity, if there's a day zero attack, okay, and someone's infiltrated your network, you got to have the lineage to understand when the attack comes in. So, so do you store everything from a compliance standpoint or not? Is time series data valuable? Do you train the model? There's proof of, proof of uh, data supply chain problems. So I mean, it's an interesting conversation because it's like, there's a cost. Right. Now, the stores get cheaper, but like, there's the hoarders and there's not. I mean, this is a it's kind of a personality thing. I mean, I, I think there totally is. Yeah. Um, I guess I was thinking a little more I love of that like we've uh, gone here. By the way, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect Marie Kondo to be a hey, does your point of deliberation here That's on the, the cube this morning. <laughs> yeah, no, this is great. Uh, I was thinking more security cameras, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. We're, you, you probably would expire that 4K color security camera footage after some amount of time—30 days, 60 days, 90 days. Uh, I don't think you need seven years of security yeah. camera footage, but Maybe you do. I mean, that, I that's talked to a CIO, I mean. and he said, he said, of all the observability data he has, they didn't even look at 10% of it. Not right. even 10%. That's, well, that's, 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 that's so they, even, not, no they don't even look yet. at it. So right. it's like they yeah. store it, but it's like, yeah, well, exactly. The same problem that uh, even the call center have, right? I mean, they say that we monitor all calls, but how many they are finance regulated oh, right. industries? They have to at least you know go through about 10 or 20 percent of the calls. Even that, they don't have the budget for. So that's why now they are using AI systems to summarize yeah. uh, the text summarization and, and voice summarization. That's a huge applicable use case. They look at it saying that you know what, we could, we could we could solve this problem by <laughs> by doing one percent of the budget. It's, that's where AI could be in advantage, maybe. How many Zoom meetings have you downloaded that you've never watched? <laughs> God, let's not think about that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I record the meeting, I'm not going to watch it. <laughs> For posterity. For posterity. I mean, I rewatch every one of our Cube segments, though. Of course. So we've got, we've got to have that, and it's fed our engine. Oh, there, there so are some pretty, a, it, yeah. so you talk about disruptive. Try uh, Gong AI. Record your sales calls and start extracting mm. uh, information and data out of that. Incredible. Yep. To be able to transcribe all of those to text, to uh, be able to search those and look for certain keywords or acronyms, yeah. uh, to set up effectively like a Google alert, except for all of your meetings, yeah. and yeah. every time your magic word comes up, and highlights, just like you know, highlighting a Slack yeah. channel, uh, having that come straight to your inbox. So yeah, you don't have to watch all of it, yeah. but you can index straight into the part that you care about to extract a little bit of signal from Productivity that is the number one asset of AI. And, and, sure. And where do you look at it? Sales, infrastructure, if you're a dev, your ops, that's going to be the test. Am I more productive? So that's the question in my mind. So if you're doing, if you're doing cluster management, what does that look like? What's mm -hmm. productivity look like there? Agreed. Uh, almost all of the use cases that come in. So again, the distinction between the AI use cases, one is production and efficiency use cases, the other one is more of innovative use cases. The innovative use cases are a little far out there, like you know, yeah. next yeah. two, three, four, whatever years. But the production use cases, when they look at it, they're like, oh my God, I could do that. And, and especially the, the code generation one, 
if you look at it, yeah. oh, I can develop the same code. So I was yeah. in conversation with one of these SIs. They take one of the, the existing open LLM and they train it with their own source code of about five million lines of source code. Now they have a code generation tool that's about 95, 98 percent accurate, which is much more accurate than that's some of awesome. their developers. Yeah. So as long as you're able to figure out how to productize yeah, yeah. that, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great use case in those areas. Well, we're talking about orders of magnitude in terms of efficiency and what people are able to do, which is which is remarkable. I mean, it's why it's so exciting. Okay, last question for you all. This has been absolutely fascinating. When we're in Paris in a few months, do you think we'll still be talking about how the CNCF community is a little bit behind the AI train, or do you think they'll have caught up? I don't think they would have caught up by then because uh, I didn't see enough from them here to say that they're going to move fast. They are still at the talking stages, so it's going to take a while. Unfortunately, that's the truth. Dustin, you agree? Maybe. Uh, I don't know the I don't I don't know the CNCF's uh, strategy. If the CNCF wants to be the home for AI, yeah, I don't think that they'll necessarily catch up by by that point. Um, but I mean, to me, cloud native computing is about the infrastructure underneath whatever whatever is going to sit on top. And maybe historically that's been SaaS software and web apps. Uh, next it's AI ML or you know, Web3 or whatever yeah. it might be. I think we're looking for just a general yeah. purpose you know, compute infrastructure. And if AI ML drives that adoption, great. If it's something point, else, yeah. so be it. I, mean, I, I think the CNCF probably does, is indifferent on whether they're AI enabled or in their messaging but every company will, by the Paris time frame, will have AI in their story. If they don't, they're not going to attract employees, not going to attract talent. Every single company will have an AI aspect of it. If they don't, they're going to be basically not on the next gen, because every company has data. They have a productivity challenge. They have customers, and I think customers' expectation is, make your product better, and AI can do that. I mean, there's some instances of your hard and hardware. So, I agree with that. I think, to answer the question in a different way, AI is increasingly becoming ubiquitous. Will it be ubiquitous in six months? M maybe, and getting darn close. Uh, but I think AI will be as ubiquitous as, yeah. I don't know, the internet or uh, <laughs> Wi-Fi. We've been hearing that a lot right, this week. Remember yeah, yeah, Wi-Fi, yeah. once upon a time, was this exotic thing that you could only find in some places, and now it's ubiquitous, yeah. it's yeah. everywhere. I think that's where we see exotic. AI get to. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> the exotic Wi-Fi. Exotic <laughs> Wi-Fi, like no. <laughs> breathing oxygen. <laughs> On the note of being exotic, we're going to go ahead and wrap this segment. Dustin and Annie, thank you both so yeah. much for being here. John, always a pleasure to hear your insights. My name's Savannah Peterson. We're here in Chicago at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon. You're watching theCUBE, the leading source for technology news. <laughs>